We've been through an historic period for the Supreme Court in recent weeks with a series of major decisions that will resonate for years or generations to come. And the retirement of the swing vote on the court, Anthony Kennedy, soon to be replaced by a Neil Gorsuch-style nominee that will likely pull the court further towards the constitutional direction and away from the progressive direction it certainly would have gone if Hillary Clinton had won the presidency. But not all the action regarding the Constitution was at the Supreme Court. Don't forget those lower courts and state judiciaries. And joining us now to analyze the state of the republic from a constitutional perspective is our regular contributor, constitutional lawyer and LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza. So, Scott, from uh, Article 1, 2, and 3 powers defining the powers of the three branches of government to the Bill of Rights defining the rights of the people. How would you describe the constitutional climate in the country now compared to, say, before Trump to the beginning of this century and to, say, a generation before that? I would actually choose to go even before the generation before that, okay, which is to go back to the founding and the generations that followed the founding, which is to say that they had a far different understanding of how those three articles and those three institutions would interact than we do now, and namely with respect to the Supreme Court. The topic of so much interest as of late with Anthony Kennedy's resignation, the Supreme Court now seems to decide almost every controversial issue that we have in this country, whether we're going to be able to get abortions, whether uh, – you know, aspects of the drug war, these immigration questions, who's going to be able to come and live here and how they're going to be able to live, whether you're going to be married to somebody you want to, want to be married to. And that is a far remove from how the order of cons- the constitutional order was envisioned, uh, where Congress, the first branch, the first article and the people's branch, uh, the people's house were were to control these things. Um, and I actually think that that's a sad state of affairs. So you're Sorry saying that, that Congress is failing to assert their Article One powers, that they that they need to step up and be more assertive in terms of legislation uh, and not be so dependent on the court serving as a backstop for whatever it is they want to do or feel they can do or can't do. They have part of the blame and and part of the solution lies with them, I would say, Tim, and also part lies with the executive. Let's not forget that when Congress passes these massive uh, pieces of legislation that grant all sorts of executive rulemaking authority, the executive can, and I think they have the, the duty to say, this is not within the executive's purview. Now, that's usually not done because who wants to give up power um, when Congress cedes it to you? But... Congress does so, so they don't have to do the the dirty work of deciding, you know, <laughs> where the regulations lie. But that that is their um, that is their purview in the Constitution, and I think they should exercise it. Now, from an historical perspective, how significant do you see the inevitable upcoming shift of the court majority in the Constitution, constitutional or strict constructionist or originalist direction? Does this signal uh, a new era for the court, or is that an exaggeration? Well, we won't know until we look backwards through the lens of history, Tim. Uh, I do hope that we get a new strict constructionist direction. Uh, f- for the most part, I think it'll just sort of take away the uh, <laughs> the inevitable guessing about how uh, Justice Kennedy uh, <laughs> would, would, would rule in a given case if we have somebody who's a bit more predictable. But Justice Kennedy did have a sort of libertarianish bent, um, and so that is the bent that we would think um, that a constitutional, uh, or excuse me, a, a strict constructionist uh, justice may have. So I don't think we're looking at a sea change necessarily, um, but perhaps it will. You know, and what we get in terms of uh, a new justice on the court will only be viewable after seeing how they rule on the cases before them. You know, it it kind of blows my mind somewhat to think about the number of Republican appointees or nominees uh, to the Supreme Court as opposed to Democrats. And looking back, again, from an historical perspective, I mean, David Souter 
and John Paul Stevens were both appointed by Republicans and yet turned out to be as far to the left as any of the Democrat appointees. Imagine where the court would be if David Souter had turned out to be what George Bush had promised he would be and if John Paul Stevens had turned out to be what Gerald Ford had expected him to be. It would definitely be a different world. Indeed. Now, it seems that the left has been reduced to talking about things like a court packing scheme, which uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, attempted to do to get his New Deal agenda through after the court had rejected one of his New Deal propositions after another. Uh, So they're talking about adding as many as six new justices to give themselves the chance at a majority. Is this... Isn't this a sign of really how desperate the progressives have gotten? Tim, when I was a kid on the playground and you wanted to institute a new rule, you would say, I call this or I call that. Like, I call this tree is safe. I call this line is out of bounds. And then if you really wanted to get smart about it, you would say, I call, you can't call without my permission. And what that meant was that no new rules could be made then after you made the one that you just settled upon. Sort of like I don't it's see how a, the, sort of like dibs. Huh? I get dibs yes, on the, on the yes. shot. On the, I don't uh, understand. The Constitution doesn't allow for dibs. So I've read about this fantastic <laughs> plan from uh, one of my better uh, my betters at either Harvard or Yale who first instituted it. I think they said that the plan was for six additional justices. So that would bring them the total to uh, to 15. But what I don't understand is how that plan then prevents the inevitable next administration from appointing 22 justices or 122 or 322. In other words, why doesn't it then just be incumbent upon the next person to just continue adding justices so that they get to take over the court? It's a recipe for um, a sort of kangaroo, uh, you know, banana republic type uh, organization. So, Scott, there's been a lot of attention paid to the Supreme Court, of course, but President Trump has been churning out nominees for the lower federal courts as well. This is where he's particularly in sync with congressional Republicans who often feel uncomfortable with his positions elsewhere, uh, to the point where Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, has commanded the Senate to stay in session in August, a rare move, so they can confirm more of Trump's judicial nominees and break through the obstruction Uh, of the Democrats. So talk a little bit about the effect that uh, Trump has had, not just on the Supreme Court, but through the federal judicial system. Trump has uh, proceeded to pace with his nominations, and Congress has proceeded to pace with its confirmation of those nominations to fill the lower and intermediate courts. And it's important that you know, we recognize that that's where the the higher courts draw their, their talent pool from. That's the bench. And so to the extent that those courts are populated with people with a certain judicial mindset, we can just see that regardless of the leadership choices going forward, they, they will influence uh, the body politic and, and, and laws going forward. We're going to close this up, Scott, with a forced prediction. Assuming we get the Gorsuch, Scalia-type nominee we expect from this president to replace Anthony Kennedy, does this court overturn Roe versus Wade, which is what the left is hysterically predicting? Yes. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. Scott Cosenza, constitutional lawyer and LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor.